It is wonderful to be in the house of the Lord, and we will be looking at Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, focusing on verse 18 and 19. Our theme this morning is the anointed miracle ministry of Jesus. Jesus began his public ministry, when you look at these verses, he began his public ministry with a very clear understanding as to why he was here. The question that needs to be before us this morning is do we understand why we're here on this earth as Christians, as born-again believers? As recorded there in Luke 4, 18 and 19, as was pointed out, Jesus was reading the prophecy of Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2. There's something very interesting there as you look at, the, at verse 19 of Luke. He was saying that he had been sent. The last thing he said was that he had been sent to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now he's reading from Isaiah, so he, he stopped. He didn't finish it. Isaiah 61 verse 2 says, And the day of the vengeance of our God. So in Luke 19 he says, I'm here to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. As he's reading from Isaiah, he stops and does not include and the day of the vengeance of our God. The well, reason being, his mission on his first coming was to usher in a day of grace, a day of salvation, a time and space of salvation and not judgment. The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, picked up on that in 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We live in a day of amazing grace, a day of salvation. God is withholding, even to this day, he is, he is withholding his judgment as he continues to seek and to save that which is lost. The day of vengeance is coming. The prophecy of Isaiah 61 verse 2 will be fulfilled. In fact, Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writing in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 7 and 8, tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance upon those who do not know the Lord, and upon those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We should not presume upon the mercies of God. We should not presume that we will have one more day of grace. Regardless of when the Lord actually comes back and this era of grace is ended, let's say that we were given a uh, a printout from heaven, and it says, the day of grace ends next week. Well, now, he's not going to do that. But if he did, you might not be here next week. Do not presume upon your day of grace. Do not harden your heart. He who is often warned, but hardens his heart, shall be cut off, suddenly and without remedy. If you're outside of Christ, you're here in a time of mercy and grace, be astounded. Take advantage of it. Cry out. Flee. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now again, Jesus began his public ministry very clearly stating the spirit of the Lord is upon me he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor the poor in heart not just to the economically poor but to the humble of heart 
with all due respect for those translations that say otherwise, but the King James at this point in verse 18 and 19 follows along with what is given in Isaiah. Isaiah talks about preaching deliverance, not only preaching deliverance to the captive, but being sent to heal the brokenhearted. Now, some of the manuscripts leave out that phrase. Poor manuscripts. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, whether your Bible reads that in uh, Luke or whether it doesn't, it is on biblical authority from Isaiah that Jesus Christ would come, and he did come, to heal the brokenhearted. To preach deliverance to the captives. Recover of sight to the blind. All of this, yes, he may do this on a physical level, but his primary ministry is that of the heart. And to set at liberty them that are bruised and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. The, miss, the miracle ministry of Jesus. Again, the Apostle Paul uh, picked up on that. He's speaking to Agrippa. He's explaining what has happened to him. Uh, Paul would have been well known as Saul of Tarsus and been going around beating up on Christians and putting them in jail. and Some of them were being killed. And so Paul says in Acts chapter 26, verse 15 through 19, and I said, he's talking about his conversation with the Lord when the Lord saved him. Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But arise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared to thee for this purpose. Going on to verse 18, to open their eyes, the eyes of the Gentiles and others, to turn them from darkness to light. And from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sin and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in Jesus. The Apostle Paul had a clear understanding, clear revelation from God as to why he was saved. Now, I cannot find any authority to suggest that any saved person has a lesser calling. No, uh, we're not Jesus Christ. No, we're not the Apostle Paul. But every believer has the privilege and the calling to walk in these steps. After all, Jesus says, follow me. We're to walk in his steps. And the Apostle Paul had this high calling of being used of God he also uh, was bivocational. He uh, did some work to help provide for his livelihood. But his passion, his calling in life was to use the gospel that the eyes of the lost might be opened, that they would be turned from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. This, this is no small task. This is no small work. Think about that. Go home and get in the mirror and talk to yourself. Open your Bible and let the Word of God speak to you. This is why you're here. This is, why, this is why you're at the workplace. This is why you're in the neighborhood. This is why you're in your family. To be used of God as an instrument of miracles through which the Holy Spirit, as you live the gospel and share the gospel, the eyes of the blind are opened. People are turned from darkness to light. They're turned from the power of Satan to the power of God. They receive forgiveness of sin. They receive an inheritance. They're joint heirs with Christ in all things. So why are you here? Jesus lives in you to manifest through you himself. Luke 18, Luke 4, verse 18 and 19 should be a, a passage that we turn to very, very often to remind ourselves of who we are and why we're here. It was a number of years ago, 
As we think about it just in a practical way about how this works out, there's a number of ways that you could go here, but I uh, was remembering uh, a pastor from out west somewhere, and I, I was at a meeting in Atlanta, Georgia, and he was doing some teaching, and he told about an incident that took place in the church to where he was pastoring at that time. They had been doing some teaching in their church, uh, encouraging the church family to have their eyes and hearts and ears open to ministry uh, wherever they were, but also especially when they came into a Sunday school class, when they came into the auditorium or the worship center, uh, to, to arrive with, uh, with hearts prepared to minister. And so on this particular Sunday, a lady we'll call Susan had her heart prepared before arriving at the church building. She walked in early for Sunday school with her eyes open, her ears open, her eyes uh, and heart open to the Lord. And uh, she ministered to some people in the Sunday school class. And, and then in the time between Sunday school and worship as she came to, into the worship center, she looked out and there were some people who had come in and some of them she knew and she spotted a lady that she didn't think she knew. So she went back to her and said, I'm Susan. I don't think we've met. What's your name? Well, my name is Jane. Well, I'm sorry if I should know, but how long have you been coming here? Four weeks. Well, if you ask that question to somebody, it could be 20 years. <laughs> you know, we go in and we have blinders on and we, we say hi to some people. And even in, even in this group, uh, I suspect if you had to stand up and just name the names of everybody that was sitting here, a lot of you couldn't do it. We live in America. We don't get involved in people's lives. We come and say, hi, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. Glad to see you. Bye. Well, she was going to go deeper. So, the lady said, about four weeks. Well, uh, have any, has anybody spoken to you? Oh, yes. People welcome me. This is a friendly church. They say they're glad I'm here. At the end of the service, they come by and say, I'm so glad you came. Hope you come back next Sunday. And that's all well and good. But Susan wanted to go further. You can go along a lot of different directions, but she went this way. She said, Jan, is there anything I could pray with you about? It doesn't always happen this way, but immediately Jan began to cry. She said, well, my husband is institutionalized. He has a serious drug problem. He wants a divorce. Our son is in Satan worship. Oh, and I don't have any problems. <laughs> Think about it. It's, it's the same with all of us. What if we get real? What if we get honest? What if we uh, intermingle with believers? What if we intermingle with people we work with? What if we have our ears and eyes open and our hearts open and, and look for, not try to force our way in, but look for opportunities to minister? Is there anything I can pray with you about? Now the door will not always be open, but sometimes it is. Jan shared her heart, and then Susan didn't just leave her there. She sat with her during the worship service and uh, had further contact with, t contact with her later and introduced her to other people and helped disciple her in the ways of the Lord. Sometime later, Jan said up until that time, she had felt welcome, but she didn't know anybody. And she had all these problems, and it almost seemed as if no one cared. When we read through the Gospels, 
Have you ever noticed this? When you look at Jesus going through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he kept running into people who had needs. And he kept meeting those needs. And I think if we're honest, you can say that you and I can go in and out of this building, in and out of our homes, in and out of our workplaces, and we don't see any needs. We would intellectually say, of course, they have needs. But it's not like our heart is beating, Lord, use me in, as a healer. How often do we see, hear, feel, stop, listen, touch, serve, so that the Holy Spirit can heal the brokenhearted? It's a lot better than just going to church. Susan came to the church meeting, having prayed, having walked in, looking, listening, desiring to be a channel. Jesus kept running into people with needs. He saw them. He met them. He spent time with them. So here's the deal. Desire and availability will open a lot of doors. You can walk in the same place this coming week, but if you walk, and if you and I walk in those same places that we normally go this coming week, but we walk in there with our eyes open, with hearts prepared through prayer and fellowship with the Lord and wanting to be used of God, we may be surprised at what we see that we didn't see. I mean, many churches in America are friendly. If you don't believe it, ask them. They'll tell you. Hi, how are you doing? Good to see you. See you next week. That's about it. It can be new members. It can be people who've been here a long time. It could be visitors. It could be whoever in the neighborhood. Why are we here? Jesus introduced his ministry by saying, I am anointed. to go about ministering because people have needs people are hurting people are lost people don't have a shepherd he came to lay down his life he connected with hurting people the woman at the well the demoniac the crowds he sat and taught them the disciples poured his life into them he kept running into people with needs and it was rooted in his receiving his calling. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the gospel. Miracles take place when a need meets a solution. When a person with pain meets a person who is in Christ and available, the power of God will be unleashed. Think about what a blessing that is. That we are on the verge of something significant taking place in our life this coming week. All that has to happen is that we be walking in the Spirit and we meet a person in need and God opens the door for us to minister. A person in need meeting a person who is in Christ and available and the power of God gets unleashed. It's the difference between the Red Sea or the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. The Sea of Galilee has an inlet and an outlet. The Dead Sea has an inlet but no outlet. Jesus came and ministered. He met needs. He lives in us to be himself. He lives in us to continue to do what he was doing when he was here on earth in flesh and blood. He's still here on earth in flesh and blood, in you, in me, in God's children. Every week, God brings a harvest of people across our paths. People with needs. People who are hurting. 
people who are in bondage. They're discouraged. They need spiritual direction. They may be lonely. They are weak, vulnerable. They hurt. They may be resentful, bitter. A lot of these needs that come across our path, and we see it. And then we go and tell somebody, you won't believe what so-and-so is doing. You, you, you won't believe how badly they're responding to what was put on their plate. I don't think that was the response of Jesus. If that had been his response to you and I, would we be saved? The hymn writer has it right. He looked beyond my faults and saw my needs and did something about it. There are people in bondages, people who are lost. There are some who have wronged us. Can you imagine Ananias as a Christian there in the New Testament era, maybe having had a wonderful day, and then God says, Ananias, I know you know this guy. His name is Saul of Tarsus. And I've got my hand on him, and I want you to go and talk to him. I don't think talking to Saul of Tarsus was on his plan. It wouldn't be on mine. I don't think it'd be on yours. And God graciously worked in Ananias' heart to where he went and spent time with this new convert that had been a Christ hater. When a person who is in Christ and who's walking in the Spirit meets a person who is in need, miracles happen. And God used Ananias to develop that work of God in Paul's life. Miracle ministries of Jesus are often shut down. The miracle never happens because we're focused on their faults or we're too busy with our own self. When I was thinking about this, I thought of a, an account in the life of Corey Tin Boom that I've shared before. To me, it is so powerful, it, it, it just has to be shared again. Some of you know that she and her sister were in the uh, prison under the Nazis and um, hundreds and thousands of people in, in this particular prison. Uh, it would be hundreds and hundreds of people just naked and the guards walking in amongst them and, and being evil and wicked. Her sister died there. And she had gotten, she had survived and, and had gotten in line with the Lord and was being used of the Lord. And in 1947, uh, she had come uh, from Holland uh, on a visit to Germany. And she was there to preach forgiveness because the people in Germany who had survived, now they were hurting, and they were bitter, and uh, so she, here she was teaching about forgiveness to these people who were so downtrodden. I mean, the, the, we think about the devastation that Germany wreaked on people. Well, they were destroyed when, when it was all said and done. And so she's teaching about forgiveness to that bombed out land. And she said, I use my favorite picture from scripture. If we confess our sins, God casts them into the deepest ocean and they're gone forever. Well, the service was over and people were still downcast and no one came out to speak to her. Except she saw in the distance one man making an approach to her. She said, at one moment I saw the overcoat and the brown hat he was wearing. The next I saw a blue uniform and a cap with its skull and bones. It came back with a rush. The huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking naked 
past this man. I could see my sister's frail form ahead of me, ribs sharp beneath the parched skin. Betsy, oh, how thin you were. This man had been one of the guards. And now he's in front of me. And his hand is outstretched. And he says, fine message, Fraulein. How good it is to know that, as you say, all of our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And I, who had spoken so glibly about forgiveness, fumbled in my pocketbook rather than to take his hand. He would not remember me, of course, but I remembered him. It was the first time since my release that I had been face to face with one of my captors. And my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, he was saying. I, I was a guard there. No, he didn't remember me. But since that time, he went on, I have become a Christian. And I know that God has forgiven me of all the cruel things I did there, but I would like to hear from your lips as well, Fraulein. And again, his hand came out, and he said, Will you forgive me? I stood there, I whose sins had been forgiven, and I could not forgive him. Betsy had died in that place. How could he erase her slow, terrible death? simply for the asking. It could have been only just a few seconds. It seemed like hours. I wrestled with the most difficult thing I had ever had to do. I knew I had to do it. Since the end of the war, I had made a home in Holland for victims of Nazi brutality. Her whole life was spent having to be having people to be healed from bitterness. And she said those who were able to forgive their former enemies would return to a normal life and rebuild their lives and go out happy, scars but not, not destroyed. Those who nursed their bitterness remained invalid, invalids. And still I stood there with coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me. I prayed silently. I can lift my hand, I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one outstretched to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, and sprang into our joined hands. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, with all my heart. For a long moment, we held each other's hand, the former guard and the former prisoner. I have never known God's love so intensely as I did then. You are, Christian, a walking miracle. Don't let the flow of the miracles be flooded or be clogged up and be stopped because of resentment. Bitterness is a lack of forgiveness. Focusing on the wrong things that others have done to you. That's not the issue. We are to forgive even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven us. God is waiting to do miracles through us. You and I live in the midst of miracles waiting to happen. They're all dressed up as needs. God delights to match persons in pain with persons with his power 
his love, and his gospel. We'll be confronted this coming week, even before this day is out, with divine appointments many times. And they'll be dressed up as needs. They may bring to your memory deep pains and hurts, so many things. Will we see them both inside and outside the church building? Here is a suggested prayer. You make it your own. Father, I thank you for loving me enough to save me. I was unworthy, unlovable, and unresponsive. But you love me, and you gave your son to pay my sin debt. You quickened my spirit in repentance and faith. You have given me your spirit. You live in and through me, miracles of your own love. Lord, I've received many blessings. It's time now for me to be a blessing. I make myself available to have my heart, my ears, my eyes open to the needs of my brothers and sisters, especially to those who have wronged me. I make myself available to have my heart, my ears, my eyes open to tell others about Jesus. Father, some to whom I have tried to share have rejected the good news because before I tried to share the good news with them, I had been living bad news before them. And so, Lord, I repent and I commit to go to them and repent. Lord, today I yield to the Spirit of the Lord and confess in faith that because I am in Christ and Christ is in me, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to proclaim the gospel, to be one available through whom the Spirit of God heals the brokenhearted. I'm to go out and to preach deliverance to the captive. The recovering of the sight to the blind by the power of the gospel to set at liberty them that are bruised by the power of the gospel to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Our Father, we bless you for this incredible high calling. We bless you, Father, that Jesus came into the temple that day and as he opened the prophet to the prophet Isaiah, he read of his divine appointment. And he didn't just read it, he received it. And then we watch him as we travel through the Gospels of how he lived it out. Only saying the things you told him to say, only doing the things you told him to do. Steadfast headed to Calvary. Never once being sidetracked by those who failed him, those who harmed him, those who meant him evil. He kept on the path of being one in whom and through whom the Spirit of the Lord was free to work. The gospel of peace, the gospel of deliverance. Now, Father, we have the privilege and the high honor and the calling to walk in his steps by the power of the Spirit of God who lives within us. We thank you, Father, that the miracle of giving forgiveness as has been given to us is not just for Coritin, Coritin Boom, but there's some of us here today who need to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow Jesus in those same steps. And for this we pray and give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and let's sing.